Good morning, Grace. It's excellent to be with you today. Thank you, Paul, for inviting me to speak. Before I read from the Bible, please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible, your inerrant, life-giving, challenging, and comforting word. Please send the Holy Spirit to speak to us through it, and specifically we ask that he would teach us about himself. We request this confidently in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So I've got two short passages I'm reading from. The first, one verse, Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus speaking. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The second passage, John chapter 16, verses 5 to 15, again Jesus speaking. Now, I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go... I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because people do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he, he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. The title for this morning's talk is, Why Does the Holy Spirit Choose to Come? Three Sundays from now is the Feast of Pentecost, when the Church remembers the Holy Spirit was poured out on 120 faithful praying followers of Jesus, and simultaneously on a crowd of Jews who were gathered at the temple, of whom about 3,000 accepted Jesus as their Lord and were baptised that day. It's the day the church was born, and ever since it has been an eagerly anticipated and day that we, where we welcome the Spirit and we ask him to once again revive the church and empower us to impact the world with the gospel. Well, of course, the Holy Spirit can and he does move powerfully at any time, not just at Pentecost, and we must expect him to do so. In addition, when it comes to a revival, there are two constant factors. First, there has never been a revival that didn't commence with a prayer meeting. And second, all revivals start with the individual, with me and you. They start when my heart is softened, when my ego is humbled, when my mind is renewed, when my spirit is submitted, when my desire is for the Father's kingdom to come and the Father's will to be done, and when my commitment is to give all the glory to the Lord and to him alone. Jesus knew that any kingdom ministry is impossible without the Holy Spirit. As I read earlier, Luke recorded that Jesus would send to his disciples what his father had promised. That's the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit, they would also receive the authority and the power they would need in the spiritual realms in order to successfully carry out what is called the Great Commission, that is to make disciples of all nations. How does someone receive a gift like the Holy Spirit? Well, there's nothing mystical here. 
A good place to start is to know and be in a healthy relationship with the giver. In this case, according to Jesus, that's the Father. Next, they need to accept the gift. They, they could choose to leave it unwrapped and unused, but that's no different from refusing the gift in the first place. And finally, they need to use the gift in an appropriate manner, because any gift can be used inappropriately. For example, if the Spirit gives someone the ability to teach, they might try and draw attention to themselves for their own personal gain, rather than teach, edify, and educate people in the gospel of grace. Over the years, I have witnessed great confusion about the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. This has led, amongst other things, to fear, misunderstanding, and division, all three of which are an anathema, because the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit pours out love and not fear, that he brings clarity, not confusion, and unity not division. In order to get myself and others in the best place to welcome the Spirit, there's a question that I have found most helpful, and it's this. Why does the Holy Spirit choose to come? Now, I know that my next, next statement could sound blasphemous, but go with me on this. For a moment, I want you to pretend that Please don't get any delusions. I want you to pretend that you are God, the Holy Spirit. I warned you. And then ask yourself this question. Why would you, as the Holy Spirit, choose to come and minister on the earth? You see, knowing the answer to why questions can be very illuminating. Have you ever wondered why you never hear the question, how did the chicken cross the road? I believe that there are four main reasons why the Holy Spirit chooses to come. And these reasons can be ranked in order of priority. What do you think they are? For the remainder of this talk, I'm going to tell you my answer, but please feel free to disagree with me. After all, none of us is the Holy Spirit, so we could all be wrong. I suspect that if you have come to any conclusions, you've thought of the fourth reason, which, as we will see, is vital and important, but not as important as the other three. My prayer is that after this talk, you will have a different understanding of the heart of God and the ways of the Spirit. The first two reasons that the Holy Spirit chooses to come are of equal importance. So first equal, the Holy Spirit chooses to come in obedience to the Father. A reminder of those last words of Jesus in Luke's Gospel. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. And earlier in Luke eleven thirteen, Jesus had promised his disciples, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Holy Spirit is God. Let's never forget that. He has all the divine qualities. By definition, he is no less powerful, no less infinite, no less omniscient, and no less present than the Father or the Son. He is co-equal with the Father and the Son, but he chooses to willingly submit to the Father and to obey him. The same was true for Jesus, who willingly chose to submit to his Father and the Spirit. Immediately after Jesus' baptism, when he was publicly affirmed by his Father and the Holy Spirit came upon him visibly in the, in the form of a dove, we read Luke 4, verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert. The Greek phrase full of literally means to be submitted to or controlled by or subjected to or under the influence of. 
this meaning still lingers in the English language when we say, I was full of anger, or I was full of love. Uh, meaning my anger or my love controlled me. And my subsequent words and actions were because of my anger and my love, for better or for worse. And we still say, I was under the influence of alcohol or drugs, which caused me to drive poorly. That's why Paul wrote in Ephesians 5.18, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, go on being filled with the Spirit. Rather than live under the influence of wine and do things that you will later forget, regret and probably forget, choose to constantly be influenced by the Holy Spirit and live an abundant life with no regrets. Jesus, whilst he lived on earth, humbled himself when he chose not to use his own rightful divine power. He willingly allowed the Spirit to lead him into the desert where he was tempted. Jesus chose to only say what his father told him to say and only do what his father told him to do. But at no point did the Spirit or the Son become inferior to the Father, or indeed to each other. What does that mean for us practically as we seek to welcome the Spirit? Well, because the Holy Spirit chooses to submit to the Father, we can see that a sign and the evidence, the expectation of a Spirit-filled Christian, or indeed a Spirit-filled church, is that they are willingly submitted and obedient to the Father. First equal, the Holy Spirit comes in obedience to the Father. And first equal, the Holy Spirit points to and glorifies Jesus. Jesus taught, John 16, 14, He, that's the Holy Spirit, will bring glory to me, that's Jesus, by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. The members of the Trinity do things first and foremost for each other, the other two members, and not primarily for us humans. We are not the centre of the universe. It doesn't revolve around us. Which means that when Jesus went to the cross, he did so primarily for the Father and the Spirit, and secondarily for the rest of creation. So, Another mark, another sign of a spirit-filled Christian and a spirit-filled church is that they are unashamedly and intentionally pointing to and giving glory to Jesus. We can tell when our corporate worship is led by the Holy Spirit because the songs we sing, the words we pray, the talks that are given, indeed all of our lives individually and corporately will be joyfully centred on Jesus. Of course, it's not wrong to focus on the Father or the Spirit, but our primary focus must be to fix our thoughts on Jesus. One of my favourite verses, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Or to fix our eyes on Jesus, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And to long to bring glory to Jesus. And when we do this, guess what? We please both the Father and the Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we read the last words Jesus spoke before his ascension. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we discover that we are both wonderfully empowered and that we want to be witnesses to the person of Jesus and all that he achieved on the cross. Why do we want to? Well, everything changes in us when we receive and experience for ourselves the amazing love of God. 1 John 4, 19, we love because God first loved us. And this love of God compels us to tell others. That was Paul's experience. He tells us that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. But there's a catch. Because the Bible tells us that this love can only be received one way. And that's by the Holy Spirit. Romans 5 verse 5. 
And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. The picture here is of a super abundance, a, a pouring out of love like the Niagara Falls. I mean, when you visit the falls, the one question you don't ask is, I wonder if we're going to run out of water. There's oodles. Plenty for me, masses for you, and torrents left over for everyone else. Likewise, the Spirit pours so much love into us that we're completely filled up. We receive all that we need. In fact, we discover that we've got plenty left over with which to love the Lord and to love ourselves. And, and then from the overflow, to love everyone around us. Ephesians chapter 3.18 tells us that this love is infinite and inexhaustible. It's impossible to measure its length or its depth or its breadth or its height. The more we receive this love from the Holy Spirit, the more we can give it away to others. And the more we give it away to others, the more we will receive ourselves. It's a, it's a virtuous circle. Twelve days after my sister-in-law accepted Jesus as her Lord, she got filled with the Holy Spirit straight away. She was on an Alpha course. And she called me 12 days later with a question. Am I doing the right thing? No, I replied, well, that depends on what you're doing. Well, she said, I've been telling all my friends about Jesus and inviting them to do the Alpha course. That sounds good, I said. What's the response? Oh, well, so far, all 12 of them have said yes. It's so easy. I don't know why every Christian isn't telling their friends. <laughs> True story. First equal, the Holy Spirit comes in obedience to the Father. And first equal, the Holy Spirit points to and glorifies Jesus Christ. Fourth. No, I haven't forgotten third. I'm just going to go to fourth first. Fourth, the Holy Spirit chooses to come in order to work in the lives of individuals. If you're honest, I suspect that most of you thought that this was the primary reason the Spirit chooses to come. The Holy Spirit works in the lives of individual unbelievers, those who haven't yet put their faith in Jesus as their only Lord. The only verse in the Bible that I'm aware of that details this work of the Holy Spirit is John 16, verse 8. Again, Jesus speaking, when he, that's the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, John, the author, whenever he uses the word world, he's referring to people who are living their lives in rebellion to God's rule. They're unbelievers. This is of the greatest concern to God, the whole Trinity, because he desires no one to perish. So he relentlessly pursues the unbeliever. The Father's great love for all people compelled him to send his own son, Jesus, to rescue us. The Son, because of his great love, willingly identified with all people and became sin on the cross. And now he desires that his incredible sacrifice was not in vain. This explains why unbelievers can often feel uncomfortable in the presence of God because he's, he's on their case. He's not prepared to pander to them and lie and say, oh, don't worry, you're a nice, good person, you'll be all right. No, the stark truth is that anyone who's not put their trust in Jesus will perish, no matter how nice and good they are. The word condemnation literally means with damnation. Therefore, to condemn someone means to damn them. That's very negative and hopeless. This is the language of Satan, the accuser. By contrast, the word conviction literally means with victory. To convict means to bring someone to a place of victory, to bring hope and new life. Satan condemns. God the Holy Spirit convicts. Jesus was teaching that the Holy Spirit convicts unbelievers of three things. Sin, righteousness and judgment. 
Sin. Sin is defined as the position of wrong relationship with God that everyone is born into. We have a positionally based faith, not a performance based. The result of being in this position of sin is that people live without God at the center of their lives. So first, the Spirit tells us the bad news. We're in a position of sin. We're in wrong relationship with God. And the wages, the consequences of this is death. We're gonna, we will all die. If, we, if we're in that position, we will all die spiritually. We will be eternally separated from the goodness of God. Then, once we're aware of our desperate situation, he tells us the good news righteousness. Righteousness is also a position. Remember, we have a position-based faith. It's the position of right relationship with the father as his daughter or his son. This position can only be received when a person puts their faith in Jesus as their Lord. For on the cross, Jesus not only took our place and our sin when he became sin, but he also gives us his righteousness, his position as the much-loved son of the Father. You can see this summed up in one verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Finally, the Spirit makes it clear to every person, whatever their position, sin or righteousness, that we will all face Jesus the judge. So best be prepared and be in the position of righteousness. As Hebrews 9.27 states, just as a person is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. That's the compassionate ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the unbeliever. But most of his work is in the lives of the righteous, in the lives of believers. Children of the Father are those who are by grace, spirit-filled and spirit-submitted. I'm going to quickly list some of the wonderful benefits of this. They know Jesus and are known by him. They know the Father well enough to call him Abba, Dad. As I've already said, they receive the love of God poured out into their hearts. They're given a new heart and moved by the Spirit to keep his holy moral laws. Their minds are renewed as they take every thought captive to Christ. In fact, they have the mind of Christ. They have a greater knowledge of God. They keep in step with the Spirit. When they're weak, they receive the Spirit's help, especially to pray. They have the Spirit of unity. They allow the Spirit to grow within them the fruit of maturity And they receive spiritual gifts, the tools to do the ministry for God's glory. According to John the Baptist, the sign of the Messiah was that he would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire, Luke 3.16. Therefore, a mark of a spiritful Christian and a spiritful church is that they are continuously filled with the Spirit. In fact, The father's children are humbly and painfully aware that they cannot live the Christian life unless they do so in the power of the Holy Spirit. And only what they do in the power of the Spirit will have lasting, eternal value. First equal, the Holy Spirit comes in obedience to the Father. And first equal, the Holy Spirit points to and glorifies Jesus. Fourth, the Holy Spirit chooses to come in order to work in the lives of individuals. So what might the third reason be? Third, the Holy Spirit chooses to come in order to build and edify the church. Drum roll. Yes, so exciting. The body of Christ, the bride of Christ. The Holy Spirit is passionate about Jesus. And he wants to present to the son, the bridegroom on his wedding day, a beautiful, perfect, holy, complete bride, the church. Okay, we know it's a work in progress because the likes of me are members of the church. But Revelation 22, 17 reveals that the bride is present in the new heaven. It's paramount that we understand how much the Holy Spirit loves the church. I think this comes as a bit of a shock to many Christians. 
We are so self-centred, especially here in the West, that we genuinely believe that it's all about moi, me. We've emphasised the individual salvation so much that the church is seen as a, a bit of an afterthought. Something we can take or leave, something we can survive without, something we certainly don't have to take seriously, or at least not as a priority. And COVID isolation and separation, coupled with Zoom and its equivalents, have exacerbated this. The Holy Spirit is calling us together to worship and bring glory to the Trinity. He's drawing us together into the Father's presence to be his family, to welcome newcomers, to pray for the sick, to comfort the hurting, to embrace the lonely, to encourage the faithful and to equip the saints. It's paramount that we understand just how much Jesus loves the church his bride. So much so that he laid down his life for her. Which leads to a hard teaching. We too are called to be martyrs, to lay down our lives for the church, the bride. Historically, that's how the church has always grown. So, unlike this individualistic, me-centered, me-first society, God's community puts others first. John 15, 13, no greater love than that a person should lay down their life for their friends. This side of heaven, what should our spirit-filled, Jesus-glorifying, Father-pleasing life look like? We are called and equipped by the Holy Spirit for two things. First of all, to edify and beautify the bride, the church, and second, to win as many as possible for the kingdom of God. That means to depopulate hell, the position of sin, and populate heaven, the position of righteousness, and then to disciple them, those in the position of righteousness, in Christ-like attitude and behavior. A mark of a spirit-filled Christian and a spirit-filled church is that they are passionate for the lost and sacrificial for the bride. In summary, in view of these reasons for the Holy Spirit choosing to come, what effect should this have on the life of every Christian and every church? We should all seek to obey and submit to the Father, to glorify and witness to Jesus, to be passionate for the loss and prepared to sacrifice for the church and to be continuously filled and totally dependent upon the Holy Spirit for every aspect of our lives. Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you for welcoming us as your children. Please help us to live each day wholeheartedly for you and for your kingdom. Lord Jesus, thank you for demonstrating your love for us by willingly submitting to the Spirit and choosing to die in our place on the cross. Please help us this week as your disciples to be your witnesses to everyone whom we meet. Holy Spirit, thank you for pouring out your love into our hearts as we choose to come under your control and influence in your mighty power Please help us to edify the church, reach the lost, and make disciples. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you so much for listening. May the Father bless you richly this week. Mm -hmm.